thank you. I'm glad to see a great turnout tonight. So um, uh, uh, thank you for having me. I was here last in 2012 talking about the 2012 elections uh, at the time. Uh, so, you know, as we'll see, there are some things that have uh, changed uh, quite a lot. Uh, this election doesn't look a lot like the last one. Uh, and there's some things that haven't uh, uh, changed as well. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about both of those uh, things. Um, you know, the, the, um, Lynn mentioned that there's going to be a lot of data. And now I know that, that for some of you, that's exciting. Right, uh, but for maybe more of you, that's maybe not so exciting. Uh, there's going to be a lot of data, uh, but let me just say this: um, you'll see a lot of numbers flying by, and, and I'm going to kind of go through a PowerPoint uh, presentation here, which is also, I know, not usually maybe the most you know engaging uh, thing. But we'll try to. I'm going to try to tell a story with a bunch of numbers here. So if you can kind of think about this as a narrative arc and try to think, try to look at uh, the bar charts or the pie charts and think about patterns uh, in the numbers. Don't worry so much about the individual numbers uh, and the patterns. And I'm going to try to point out uh, big patterns in the numbers that kind of tell a story uh, that I think can help us make some sense out of, um, you know, some of the kind of wild twists and turns that the current election uh, is taking uh, on both the Republican and the Democratic side uh, of the aisle. Uh, and also just some of the bigger picture uh, things in terms of issues that are um, immigration, uh, gay and lesbian rights, uh, reproductive health and rights, and these kind of um, is issues that are perennial issues in our politics, um, how um, some of the demographic changes and religious changes in the country may help make sense of exactly how those are going uh, today. Um, so some of the data that you're going to see here is a little bit of a preview of um, my book that uh, Lynn mentioned uh, called The End of White Christian America. Now, this is a book with a kind of a provocative title, but it's actually a data-driven book book uh, with a fair number of charts, but it, it, again, tells a story, and the story really is one of um, not just a kind of demographic decline, but a kind of um, cultural decline of kind of, uh, of white Christian culture in America, white Christian uh, denominations in America, and the increasing diversity in the country, uh, both in terms of race uh, and religious affiliation, and what that means uh, for how that, and, and how that's changing uh, kind of political calculus in, among Republicans and Democrats, and how it's changing um, kind of just in general, our approach to public policy um, issues in general. Um, so let me kind of start with a couple of um, just long-term, like a look back, okay? I'm going to try to look back to a time past when most of you in the room were born. Uh, so back to uh, the uh, sort of mid-1970s. Um, now, if we take a look back, and, and this data is from the General Social Survey, which is one of the longest-running um, uh, sociological surveys in the, in the country, and then married up to uh, PRI's data from 2010 and forward. Uh, but again, if you think about the big patterns here, and what we're really seeing is the, the blue line that's sort of declining here is uh, the percentage of the country that it identifies as Protestant uh, and Christian. So you can see that in the mid-1970s, 63% of the country identifies as Protestant. Uh, by the time we get to uh, 2014, that number dips below majority support. Uh, the, our last numbers on that from 2015 are 46% of the country is Protestant. Uh, you can see the next line, the orange line across there is Catholics. They have remained fairly stable um, across this time. About a quarter of the country uh, identifies as Catholic, although I'm going to point out some interesting internal diversity among Catholics in a minute. Um, but you will see a little bit of a dip there in the last few years, um, dropping down to around 21% of the country. Um, one of the more dramatic stories in the religious landscape is this green line, uh, religiously unaffiliated Americans, sometimes called the nuns. Now, not the N-U-N-S's, but the N-O-N-E-S's, right? Those who claim, and the reason they're called that is because in most quantitative surveys in political science and sociology, the way this question gets asked about religious identification, it just says, what is your religion? Are you Protestant? Are you Catholic? Are you Jewish, uh, Muslim, you Hindu? It kind of gives you a long list to pick from. And these are the people who pick nothing in particular, are none at the end of the at the end of that uh, question and one of the things we've been noticing um, in social science surveys is that this number all the way really up until the 1990s was in single digits um, starting in the 1990s you can see this really strong uptick and last year um, 23 percent of, of Americans um, identified as uh, as nothing in particular as, as saying that they had no particular religious affiliation so that's the highest number uh, recorded uh, since we've really been tracking uh, this number with social science uh, data so I'm gonna take a look down uh, inside of a couple of these boxes so this is if you take a look inside of all Protestants what is the racial composition of all Protestants and how has that shifted over time uh, this lighter blue um, area on the bottom is white Protestants and so what you can see basically from looking at this number is that it the decline of Protestants in the country has been almost wholly accounted for by the decline of white 
Protestants um, in the country. In fact, 1993 was the last year that, a major that the majority of Americans identified as white and Protestant. Um, so ever since then, we've been a majority, uh, sort of, uh, less than a majority white Protestant uh, country. That's that little peak there in the middle. Um, African American Protestants have remained fairly stable um, over this time, about one in 10 uh, or so are um, African American Protestants. And then you can see the rise of uh, Latino Protestants, really, um, on this last little part here. So uh, that has to do with um, uh, really mostly with immigration picking up in in, uh, in the 2000s. Um, and we, we see the kind of um, growth there. So we have actually growth among Latinos, um, steadiness among African Americans, and a, a drop among uh, white Protestants in the country. So in fact, if you look back in the 1970s, the, the country was a majority white and Protestant, not just a majority Protestant, but a majority white and Protestant. Today, it's about a third of the country is white and Protestant. Um, we see a very similar um, uh, uh, thing among Catholics in the country. Again, this kind of lighter blue on the bottom um, is uh, white Catholics in the country. And we kind of have a little thin strata of, of uh, other race, so that's African American, Asian, uh, and others. And then this kind of greener colors are Latino Catholics. And you can see an even more pronounced um, uh, growth in Latino Catholics, really, again, since, since uh, the turn of the century here. And in fact, that's the, that's the main thing keeping the percentage of Catholics stable, right? Because you see this kind of precipitous drop off of white Catholics um, in the country uh, here beginning in the 2000s. Again, we're down, uh, you know, some, uh, below 15% a white, white Catholic, and we were up at 25% uh, in, the, in the 1970s here. So what is all the, where does all this leave us? Um, so this, this chart is a, um, a breakdown by race and religion of, uh, of the entire uh, U.S. population. And what I've done is I've colored in, um, in the shades of blue, varieties of white Christians. So white Catholics, white Protestants, and both evangelical and mainline variety, uh, Mormons, Orthodox Christians who identify as white. And the one thing you'll mostly see here is that um, if you add all of the white Christians in the country together, uh, they come to 45% of the country. All right, so far less than a majority of the country. Uh, you can see the, the kind of oranges here are uh, varieties of non-white uh, Christian Americans. The purples are Americans who identify with some other uh, religion in the country, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam. Uh, and again, the big, uh, you know, the big uh, wedge there, 23%, are those who claim no religious affiliation uh, in the country. Now, you can sort of tell that this is kind of a recent trend. One way to really see how pronounced this sea change is across generations is to kind of actually break it up uh, by generation. Um, so here's a chart taking that same, those same religious breakdowns, but breaking them down uh, by generational cohorts. So you can kind of think of this as sort of like a, you know, archaeological dig, how you kind of dig down through the layers and the kind of further down you go, the older it gets. Uh, so if you go left to right, um, you know, what we have here is that young people on the far left, under the age of 30, um, look really different than, say, seniors on the other side. Again, so if you don't worry about the, the numbers, but you just look at the patterns, um, you can see the sort of decline in the number of white Christian uh, white Christians in each generational cohort here. In fact, um, uh, nearly seven in 10 seniors identify as white and Christian, a number that drops to only about three in 10 among uh, the youngest uh, cohort in the, in the country. And then on the other end, the biggest change, again, are religiously unaffiliated Americans. Only about one in 10 seniors uh, claim no religious affiliation at all, uh, but that number is 36% among younger Americans today. So in just a few generations time, we've seen actually quite a sea change change uh, in the religious composition uh, of the country. Um, one other way to just kind of look at this, if I take um, a group that has a very outsized presence among seniors and a group that has a very outsized presence among youngest Americans and plot it by age, uh, and here um, we have a data set that's, um, that actually has um, 80,000 people in it. So we actually have quite a, this is a huge data set. Uh, and we are able to kind of chart this um, actually by 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds. And when we, when we plot this, and we're plotting uh, white evangelical identification uh, in blue and uh, religiously unaffiliated affiliation in green, you can just really see that the generational um, uh, switches here. They're kind of inverses of one another. Among those oldest Americans, uh, there are um, nearly three times as many uh, white evangelicals as there are unaffiliated. And uh, among the uh, sort of youngest cohort of adults in America, there's about four times as many unaffiliated Americans as there are white evangelical Americans. So a real flip, um, again, just over a few generations' time. Um, one other thing to say about this is that um, this, uh, these changes aren't 
uh, just bi-coastal and urban kinds of changes. They actually are happening all over the country. So we just finished with the Iowa caucuses. We at PRI have been doing a lot of uh, demographic crunching of data for the, the caucuses uh, and, and for the primaries. And so one of the things we did is we took a look at religious change in Iowa. Um, and this is just from 2007, so right before Obama uh, was elected until uh, 2015 today. Um, and just over these eight years, um, what we've seen are pretty dramatic changes, even in Iowa, Heartland, you know, Heartland America, if there ever was anything. And we basically see like a, a nearly 10 point uptick in the number of religiously unaffiliated uh, Iowans. Uh, the one place that Iowa is bucking the trend is that white evangelicals have remained about a quarter of Iowans uh, across here. But if you look at other white Christian groups, white Catholics uh, and white mainline Protestants, they've each dropped five percentage points um, over this time. So the general trend in the country is still there, uh, even though white evangelicals have kind of held their own. And this is the national benchmarks on the right, just so you can kind of see them side by side by side. So so what difference does all this make? Um, so I'm gonna, one difference it makes is, is um, before I get to kind of politics or any of that, one difference it makes is that people in different generational cohorts now think very differently about what it means to be an American and how important uh, certain religious identities are uh, for, for, what, for being American or for the country. Um, so here's a couple of questions. One of them um, uh, uh, really shows changing views. So it's like, which of these statements do you agree with more? Uh, the first one is, America has always been and is currently a Christian nation. The second one, America was a Christian nation in the past, but it is not now. The third one, America has never been a Christian nation. Again, if we start with the oldest Americans over there on the right, um, what you see is um, a pretty strong agreement with the first two statements. In fact, a plurality agreeing with the first statement, America has always been and is currently a Christian nation. If you look at the younger people um, all the way on the other side, um, only 26% of young people agree with that statement uh, that America is and always has been. Uh, uh, slim majority, 51, say that it was in the past, is not now. Um, you can even see this more clearly um, in a, another question that gets at a similar sentiment. Um, how important is being Christian for being truly American? Is it very important, somewhat important, not too important, not at all important? And again, um, you know, the, uh, the country is a little bit divided, but a, um, a kind of 53% saying uh, that it's at least somewhat important for being truly American. Uh, but look at millennials here, 18 to 35 year olds. Um, only 30, what is it, 35% of millennials um, say that this is somewhat important for being American. Uh, but if you look at uh, seniors, it's three quarters of seniors saying that this is like uh, at least somewhat important for being truly American. So the, the very idea of what it means to be American has really shifted in just a few generations uh, time. And this is just about kind of culture and what it means to be American. Um, so that's one of the things going on here is that older generations have a very different idea um, ab about uh, the place of religion, the place of Christianity in particular, uh, and, and the place of minority religions in American public life than, uh, than younger people do. And uh, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to shift ground here a little bit and talk about the other things that I think are playing, two other things that I think are playing a part in how the election cycle is going and what we're seeing expressed uh, in the campaigns. Um, the next one is really, um, it's actually economic. So it has a lot to do with religion, but I think this is part of the mix of what's, what's happening here. So I'm going to talk about economic anxiety and then cultural anxiety on top of all of this religious and, and ethnic change is, I think, part of the, the soup that we're swimming in uh, in this election cycle. So um, how, do, how do people feel? I don't know if you remember the slide I had at the beginning. It was kind of an upside-down picture of the Capitol building reflected in a mud puddle. Um, we kind of picked that, uh, we picked that uh, image uh, for the report that we did for um, our American Values Survey last, last fall because we were so struck when we, when we analyzed the answers that Americans gave at how pessimistic Americans were feeling about the economy, about the future, uh, and it was this real sense of, of um, kind of anxiety and even pessimism here. So I'm going to give you a couple of samples. This is just from uh, uh, no, uh, data from November. Um, so we've been asking people um, in the past, this is 2012 and 2014, do you think the co country's economic recession is over or do you think the, uh, the economy is still in a recession? Now, most economists have been telling us for quite some time that we're out of a recession, that we're not technically meeting any kind of economic definition uh, for a recession. Uh, but when we ask people again uh, in 2015 whether we're still in a recession, this is what they told us, right? 72% of the country, we are still in a recession. Uh, so even though whatever the macro indicators are indicating, it has not trickled down to uh, people's everyday lives. People are still feeling a lot of economic uh, anxiety uh, in the country. Um, another question that we have asked 
um, uh, for a while and that is a pretty good barometer is just a kind of basic question about the American dream, this idea that if you work hard, you, you play by the rules, you can get ahead, right? Just kind of this basic uh, hard work ethic. Uh, Americans are pretty divided um, about whether this still holds true in the country anymore. In fact, less than a majority, 42%, uh, say uh, that the, the American dream, if you work hard, you'll get ahead, still holds true. Um, uh, nearly half say, well, it once held true, but it no longer does. And about one in 10 say um, it never held true. And there are some big divides. Um, white Americans are basically divided, um, but there are big class divides among white Americans. So what you can basically see here is that white working class Americans, that is uh, white Americans without a college degree, um, are feeling much more pessimistic about this than those with a college, uh, those with a college degree. And that divide is really important uh, for kind of what's, ha what's happening, I think, in the election, uh, that we're seeing particularly white working class Americans feeling a lot of anxiety, not, a, not just about economics, but about cultural changes um, in the country. Um, African Americans also feeling uh, fairly uh, pessimistic about this, only 3 in 10 uh, saying that this is still true today, with Latinos looking a little more um, a little more optimistic, but really about like the country overall, still only about 4 in 10 saying this still holds true uh, today. Um, and one of the other things that we saw, um, one effect of this is um, in attitudes about equal opportunity, we've been asking this question for quite a while over the last six years, and basically this question has always been really, really stable, with 53, 54% uh, saying uh, that uh, one of the biggest problems in the country is that we don't give everyone an equal chance in life. But over just the past year, we saw a 10-point increase in, this, in the question of people saying one of the biggest problems that we have in the country is that we don't give everyone an equal chance in life. So again, a kind of economic anxiety measure of people feeling like the deck, the deck is stacked against them, they can't get ahead. Um, and I think that is part of what we're dealing with. Um, and just one more to, you know, not put uh, too fine a point on it. Uh, but again, just over the last, uh, from 2012 until um, uh, 2015, do you think America's best days are ahead of us or behind us? A majority of Americans said, uh, not a, a large majority, but still a majority in 2012, said our best days are ahead of us. Uh, today, the country is evenly divided um, on this question. So, um, so we've seen a, a six-point drop, uh, uh, sorry, five-point drop in, in the number of Americans that say our best days are ahead of us. Um, so, um, so that's kind of part of what's going on. Oh, and I should break this out by party. So here, there's huge partisan differences on this question, which I think explains some of why you're hearing uh, from the Republican primary side a lot of sort of negativity, a lot of things that are wrong that need to be fixed. On the Democratic side, you're hearing a lot more optimism uh, and, uh, and things that, you know, we could do better, certainly, but, but not nearly the kind of pessimism. And this really is about their base, right? So that uh, among Republicans, those who identify with the Tea Party, um, much more pessimistic about this than those who identify as either indep independents or, or even or as Democrats. Um, the other kind of way you can kind of see a little populist edge in the, in the, uh, in the electorate um, today and in the population, we asked this long question on who is the government looking out for? Uh, whose interests are they looking out for? The, um, the, uh, which of the following groups? The two that jump out immediately, right, are the top two, wealthy people and large businesses. That's who people think the government's looking out for. Um, and there's pretty much bipartisan agreement on this, not a, lot of, um, not a lot of disagreement. And then, you know, then there's a bunch of other things here where there start to be a little more disagreement um, maybe not as strong feelings, but there's kind of a consensus um, on these two. Um, but then when I sort of, uh, I'm going to kind of isolate just a couple. Uh, one, we also asked this about people like you, and, and I'm going to show you uh, people like you also, is the government taking care of African Americans? Is the government taking care of gay and the needs and interests of gay and lesbian people? And uh, showed this to you by, um, uh, by party uh, break. So if you look at those who identify with the Tea Party uh, and Republicans, um, only about, uh, only 37% say the government's looking out for the needs and interests of them, uh, but uh, about three quarters or more um, say uh, that the government is looking out for the interests of African Americans or gay and lesbian people. Uh, and, and this is a very different partisan view here than if you look at independents or, or Democrats here, where Democrats are actually the only group uh, where a majority says the government's looking out uh, for, for their needs and interests, uh, maybe because they've got uh, President Obama in the White House. Uh, maybe one reason why they feel that they feel that way, um, but but uh, less likely to say. Um, but I think this is part of um, what I'm going to kind of point to here. I'll come to this is a good segue to the cultural um, anxiety piece. Is that there is this kind of perception, um, particularly among I think again, it's, it's, um, white uh, working class Americans. Um, 
particularly in the Midwest and the South, um, that the government is looking out for everyone else except for them. Um, and that's kind of part of the perception, I think, that's happening um, here. Uh, this, you can also see this in the religious landscape. Uh, so I did the same question broken out by white evangelical Protestants uh, who look, um, not surprisingly, like Republicans since, uh, because they are um, overwhelmingly vote for Republican candidates. So their um, views are fairly aligned on this question. And then the religiously unaffiliated who have a very different uh, view of who the government is looking out for. Um, so that leads me to kind of cultural anxieties. Um, one of the things we've seen over the last um, three years, um, and, and even over the past one year, is an uptick in anxieties about immigrants, uh, uptick in anxieties around Islam and the place of Muslims in American society, uh, and an uptick um, in uh, uh, concern in, in racial uh, tensions, uh, particularly around uh, the kind of Black Lives Matter movement uh, and what, what's going on with um, kind of uh, police treatment of African Americans in the country, big, huge racial gaps on, on these questions. Um, so I'll give you just a couple of examples. Um, in, in 2012, we asked, in 2015, we asked this question, do you agree or disagree? It bothers me when I come into contact with immigrants who speak little or no English. Uh, in 2012, only 40% of the country uh, said yes to this, they agree with this question. By 2015, it had jumped eight points, uh, up to nearly half, uh, saying that they agree uh, with this question. Uh, so you can put, if I put the disagree side, you can really see the difference as well, you know, kind of from 57% disagree to only 51% uh, uh, disagree. And then if we look at this, um, again, here's the same numbers, 40, 48, 51. Um, but if we look at the same number again by, um, by race and class, uh, what we see here is that um, white college-educated Americans and white working-class Americans are basically mirror images of each other on this question, right? So with white college-educated Americans, much more likely about 6 in 10 saying they disagree with the statement. White working-class Americans, 6 in 10 saying they agree uh, with the statement. Also big generational divides uh, here, right? Uh, Americans under the age of 30, um, nearly two-thirds, uh, up around 63%, uh, saying they disagree. And then eight, uh, seniors age 65 and older, 55%, saying they agree uh, with this statement. Um, so this is kind of, a, kind of around Im immigration, immigrants. Um, the other question that's around kind of a racial resentment um, question um, and this uh, a sense of kind of uh, so-called reverse discrimination. Uh, we had this question, the question literally reads, uh, today discrimination against, against whites has become as big a problem as discrimination against blacks and other minorities. Do you agree or disagree uh, with that statement? Um, so here is where um, the country is. 43% of Americans agree uh, with that statement. But if you look at um, partisanship here, is a huge divide, right? huge partisan divide here. 68% um, of those who identify with the Tea Party, 64% uh, of those uh, who identify as Republicans agreeing with the statement, um, only 28% of Democrats um, agreeing with the statement. Um, and here's the other side of that, of that question, just so you can kind of see the, the contrast. Um, but this is part of a whole pattern. I don't have other slides on this, but if we ask about um, uh, police treatment of African Americans, uh, whether there's um, anything unfair going on, uh, whites and blacks have very, very different views uh, on, on those on those questions. Um, basically, one of the one of the uh, questions that has uh, sort of stuck with me, um, you know, I have a slide here, but uh, basically ask uh, whether um, the killings of, of unarmed black men by police over the past year and a half is part of a larger pattern, or is it um, part of a uh, or are they isolated incidents? Um, basically, um, uh, by eighty five percent of African Americans say it is part of a broader pattern. Uh, two-thirds of whites say they are isolated incidents, right? So just very, very different racial views um, on, on a kind of really basic question uh, like that. Um, we also saw, I mean, you may have seen the um, uh, news about President Obama going uh, to visit a mosque. Uh, yesterday, um, and we've heard a lot of uh, rhetoric and the campaigns about Islam it's, and the place of Muslims in American society. And we have seen um, in the in, in our data, this goes back to 2011 till today. Um, again, an agree disagree question: The values of Islam are at odds with American values and way of life. Do you agree or disagree with the statement? The country's basically been pretty divided on this question up until this past year, and we found for the first time a majority of Americans saying they agree. Uh, with this statement, an uptick, and that uptick has been largely on the among among uh, political conservatives uh, that have had that have driven this uptick. Um, uh, kind of older Americans and political conservatives that have uh, contributed this uptick. Um, and I broke this out by religious groups. Uh, so this is a question about religion, uh, fundamentally. Um, values of Islam at odds with American values in a way of life. 
And what you basically see here is that um, all religious groups in the country actually agree with this statement. Um, uh, and, and it's most pronounced among white evangelical Protestant groups. Nearly three quarters of white evangelical Protestants agree, uh, but so do 55% of African American Protestants, which is predominantly a Democratic uh, constituency um, in the country. Uh, the groups that don't agree um, in, on the religious landscape are the religiously unaffiliated uh, and no, those who are identified with non Christian religions, which include, in court, of course, includes Muslims themselves in that category. Uh, which is part of part of what's uh, going on there. Um, there's the other side of that. Uh, one other thing, to, if I try to take, take a step back, but, and this will be the last slide before I kind of take a look at the elections. Um, cultural changes since the 1950s. Um, this has been one of the more interesting questions we've asked. Um, so it's just a kind of basic question, uh, big picture, since the 1950s. Uh, that's the benchmark. Do you think American culture and way of life has, has mostly changed for the better or has it mostly changed for the worse? Um, and basically what we see here is 46% of the country say it's mostly changed for the better. 53% say it's mostly changed for the worse. Uh, but big racial divides uh, in the country on this question. 60% uh, of African Americans saying it's mostly changed for the better. Also 54% of Hispanics uh, saying it's mostly changed for the better. Um, but if you look at, at whites and even if you break out uh, whites by class, um, working class or college educated whites, similar picture, 50, about six and 10, uh, saying that things have mostly changed for the worse uh, since the 1950s. And I think part, that sort of hearkening back to, uh, you know, a sort of uh, uh, time when things were better is kind of part of what we're seeing playing out on the campaign trail as well. I went ahead and broke this out by religion uh, because one of the reasons I, I want to break it out by religion and look particularly at uh, white evangelical Protestants over there on the right is because you get a kind of multiplier effect when you look at not only race, but also religion, uh, right? So I think part of what this is going on is like um, kind of hearkening back to, you know, for white evangelical, we're here in North Carolina, a lot of white evangelicals in North Carolina. I was raised in Mississippi, uh, but this sort of sense that um, uh, a simpler time, uh, you know, a time uh, when white evangelical Protestants, I think, felt like they were more at the center of American culture uh, than they do uh, today. And I think that you see the 72 percent uh, things that say that mostly uh, things have changed for the worse uh, since the 1950s. Um, uh, but you see uh, those of, no, of non-Christian religions mostly changed for the worse. Catholics are divided, but when we break out Catholics uh, by ethnicity, we basically see this same mirrored image. White Catholics think things have changed mostly for the worse, uh, and Latino Catholics think they've changed mostly for the better. So um, kind of race and religion working together on these, on these questions. Um, all right, so let me kind of turn to the religion and presidential elections for the home stretch here. Um, so, what it, so that's the kind of big picture context. What do we know about kind of how religion has been shaking out in the uh, political race. Uh, so first I thought just for context, I'd put up here the 2012 uh, vote by religious groups. This is from the national exit polls in 2012. Um, and basically what you see is again, this sort of uh, pattern that has to do, it's kind of an overlay of race and religion um, that kind of dictates the voting patterns here. Um, you look on the far left, the group, the things that these groups have in common, white evangelicals, Mormons, white Catholics, white mainline Protestants uh, that, have, that mostly voted for Mitt Romney, is of course they're white, non-Hispanic uh, groups. Uh, and if you look in, kind of to the right of that, you find the groups that are more strongly aligned with Obama, uh, Jews, the religiously unaffiliated, uh, Latino Catholics, um, and African American Protestants up at 95% um, uh, off the chart uh, here. So, um, so that's kind of been the lay of the land in the last election. Um, and if I look back at, uh, the last three presidential election cycles, and I'm just showing one side for simplicity here. This is the support for Democratic presidential candidates. You can see that the pattern has been fairly stable, really, for quite some time, right? So um, 2004, 2008, 2012, not a lot of differences uh, in the kind of religious voting patterns um, over time. Uh, and <clears throat> just kind of put one, uh, when hearing a lot about evangelicals, I thought I would kind of pull out evangelicals um, just so you can see both sides uh, for that time period for white evangelical Protestants. Um, what's remarkable about this, right, is that um, we have, in, in this time period, there were three very different candidates at the top of the Republican ticket uh, here, right? So we have George W. Bush, John McCain, Mitt Romney, right? These are three very different people at the top of the ticket, and yet the support is tabletop flat, uh, really, here, about eight and ten. Um, uh, there was a little bit of dip in, in 2008, but still, you know, uh, three quarters uh, for sure support for uh, Republican candidates across the board. Um, and we're seeing, I'll show you in a second, um, you know, fairly warm support for all, all three of the top three 
uh, uh, Republican contenders among evangelicals right now. Um, one other interesting thing uh, that's happening, though, is um, that I think the Mitt Romney campaign learned the hard way is that reliance on um, white Christian voters is a uh, kind of diminishing returns strategy. Um, so one of the things we're seeing is that over time, uh, every four years, there are fewer white Christian voters um, in the electorate. And in fact, uh, by the time we get to, um, so we do 2016, 2020, 2024, by the time we get to 2024, if current trends hold, um, we will see, right, right, we already see a minority of white Christians in, in the general population, but because whites tend to turn out at higher rates than non-whites in elections, they still make up a higher percentage of the electorate. But by 2024, even with that higher rate of return, uh, we will see the first national election where uh, white Christian voters will make up a minority of voters. So if, if a candidate stacked up every last white Christian vote in the country, if that's all the votes they got, they would lose uh, in 2024 for the first time. So that's a kind of remarkable you know, um, shift to where we are. Um, and this, this chart shows over time, back from the Clinton days um, up to uh, the last major election, how much each party has been relying on white Christian votes. And so one of the things you'll see here that I think presents a real challenge for the Republican side of the ticket is that um, Republicans have continued to rely on about 80% of their coalition being white Christian voters, um, even as the number of those voters has been declining uh, in the population. So they're kind of uh, strongly reliant on a group that's getting smaller, while Democrats have been sort of following the trends more uh, in, in the population and relying less and less. And so this is, uh, if you look at 2012, for example, really stark difference. Mitt Romney's vote coalition who supported Mitt Romney was 80% Made up, made up of 80% of white Christian voters. Barack Obama's coalition that supported him was made up of 37% uh, white Christian voters. So there's kind of been a partisan sorting here. Um, uh, that, and and there's, it's not just on that end. The other, uh, the other end of it is the unaffiliated vote, right? So I told you that the religiously unaffiliated Americans are now 23% of the country. Uh, and there has now become also this kind of drift uh, uh, are kind of partisan sorting, even among uh, the religiously unaffiliated uh, voters. So this chart is um, shows you a few things at one time. Um, it, the numbers on the chart show you uh, the percentage that each candidate got of the uh, unaffiliated vote um, uh, in, in that election cycle. And the size of the bubbles show you how important that vote was to their election was to their uh, voting coalition. So that's the reason the Democratic kind of bubbles here are bigger because it was more important to their overall coalition, uh, and the um, Republican uh, red bubbles are a little smaller. But you know what's interesting about this is if you go back into the 80s and, and certainly to 1980, there was almost no partisan divide between. Uh, uh, um, the on the unaffiliated vote. But as this group has gotten bigger, which really happened mostly in the 90s, that's where you can start seeing the separation uh, out into kind of partisan camps with now we have um, you know, nearly three to one, uh, the religiously unaffiliated votes going to uh, Democratic candidates over Republican candidates. Uh, now, there's a little caveat here, and that is um, that even though religiously unaffiliated Americans are growing every year, they don't vote. Um, so that's the, um, they don't vote at rates uh, representative of, of the population. Um, so and a part of this is because, um, I'm talking to a younger audience, uh, part of this is because they are younger and younger people have voted um, uh, historically less at less rate, less high rates than older people have in the country. But as you can see, um, if you, the, the blue bars here are um, the percent of population. Uh, so going up to 2014, 22% of the population, uh, only 12% though of voters, right? So uh, 10 percentage points uh, difference between the general population and voters among, uh, among uh, the uh, religiously unaffiliated. Uh, if you look at 2012, um, there's a nice benchmark in 2012, um, uh, they made up 20% of voters, 20% uh, of the population, but only 12% of voters. Uh, if I kind of put up white evangelical Protestants uh, as a benchmark against that, they also made up 20% of the population that year, but they made up 26% of voters, right? So they actually were represented at a higher rate among the voting population than they were in the general population. So uh, what you ended up with then is that even though uh, white evangelicals and the religiously unaffiliated were basically equal in, in, size, in, in size in the population in 2012, um, the voting power of white evangelical Protestants outpaced them by a factor of three. Uh, because they turned out at, high, at much higher rates um, than uh, than religiously unaffiliated did. Um, put up one. I uh, have one slide about Trump here. I can talk a little bit more of that in the in the Q and A if you want to. But um, 
One of the interesting things to watch about the Republican side of the, uh, which, uh, of the uh, debate, which really is heavily reliant, particularly in the early primary states, uh, on white evangelical support. So in Iowa, for example, um, Iowa, as we saw in this previous chart, are only um, about a quarter of Iowans are white evangelical Protestants. But among GOP caucus goers, they are 60% of GOP caucus goers. So hugely important in Ohio. Uh, the next big state we have, New Hampshire, is only 9% white evangelical Protestant, so it won't be a player there. But in South Carolina, uh, next door neighbor here, uh, it looks like it, the best estimates I've seen are, are that the GOP primary voters there will be nearly two-thirds white evangelical Protestant. Uh, so it's playing a huge outsized role uh, in these early states in particular. So it's, it's important where the candidates are with this, with this very important group in the primaries. Um, one of the things we've seen is that actually Trump, Rubio, and Cruz have all improved their standing among white evangelical voters since December, uh, but in different ways. Um, Trump, uh, sorry, Cruz and Rubio in December were still largely unknown to about a third of white evangelical voters. So they expressed no opinion, said they didn't know enough about them to offer an opinion. And what has happened is as they have um, gotten to know them a little better with all the debates and the, and the uh, political ads, uh, they have kind of, most of them have come over to the favorability side uh, now. So that uh, Cruz is up around six and 10 favorable, uh, Rubio is about 55% uh, favorable. But the most interesting one is Trump. Uh, right, who, who is kind of, by any objective measure, uh, the most different uh, from a, your average white evangelical voter uh, uh, than, than certainly than Cruz or Rubio. And, and he actually started off, people knew who he was even in December, right? He, he didn't have a name recognition uh, problem, but he did have a favorability problem. So in December, um, our numbers were showing that he had a 56% unfavorable view among white evangelical Protestants uh, in December, which didn't seem that surprising. Um, uh, but by January, and just, it was just a few weeks ago, um, right at the end of January, actually, this, this top, top strip, he had turned that around um, and has actually had now 53% favorable view among white evangelical Protestants. So there's been a kind of, Trump has actually turned unfavorables into favorables um, over this last uh, few weeks. We could talk a little bit more about uh, what, why we think that's happening. Um, it, it is an interesting thing happening uh, when um, he's clearly had a lot of religious gaffes over the thing and still seems to have been able to kind of survive that and, and turn it into favorable uh, ratings. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap this up with just showing just a couple of the, the national polls, uh, what the latest national polls are showing here. Um, basically, Trump uh, out ahead, uh, Cruz and Rubio um, right behind, uh, Carson sort of flagging, and then uh, the Democratic race basically tightening up uh, with... Um, and the only reason we have 28% up in October was that Joe Biden was still uh, somebody people were considering. And once he dropped out, uh, it's kind of sorted itself out and has now tightened up uh, quite a lot. And um, where polls are in New Hampshire showing actually Sanders, um, Sanders ahead uh, right now. Um, so with that, I will um, kind of wrap it up. But uh, to kind of sum it up here, one of the things that I think can help us understand um, kind of not only the kind of current election cycle we're in, some of the rhetoric that we're hearing, uh, some of the kind of strategic decisions that the candidates are making um, is kind of the religious and cultural transformations that we're seeing in society that have a kind of both a religious and a racial overlay to them. Uh, and then wrap that up with anxieties about the economy, people feeling really um, uh, anxious about where the country's going economically, uh, and kind of cultural anxieties that, have, that are kind of wrapped up with uh, uh, changing culture from immigration, uh, religious minorities, and then kind of racial tensions where white and black Americans are really seeing uh, recent events through very, very different lenses. And I think all of that is kind of part of the mix of kind of what we're seeing uh, in the current election cycle, and we'll see it play out over the next, uh, in the next few months till we get to the conventions uh, in, in July. Um, so I will stop right there, and we'll... Uh, Take, take some questions. Thanks.